Thank you. So I will merge the, the end of the last, uh, the third lecture with the fourth one. And I will speak about uh, essentially non commutative, uh, so non commutative big products. And a bit about cumulants that I was supposed to discuss during the third lecture, but it's, it also fits this this setting. So, if you think about uh, central limit theorems, the the problem is to compute. The expectation value of uh, expressions like this, so a sum of uh, independent, identically distributed random variables to the power n, and you have the same, uh, essentially the same problem if you replace random variables by uh, operators, and choose some notion of independence between the operators, and replace the expectation by uh, an arbitrary unit of linear form. So what happens in classical probability? Is that uh, these computations are easy, essentially because if you, uh, if you think in terms of generating series, for example, and you want to compute the generating series of momenta of the sum of two uh, independent random variables, Then because uh, they are independent, you can split the computation and you get a, the product of exponentials. And so if you linearize this by taking logarithm, what you get is a sum. And this expression is by definition the generating series of cumulants. And so, um, so the generating series of, of cumulants that I've already introduced. And so, um, finally, the, the conclusion is that cumulants linearize whatever it means, independence. And this is a general principle. You want, when you have a notion of independence, to have a notion of cumulants that give you a linear criterion for, for independence to holds, in the sense that, uh, so in that case, yeah, not this case, why? Uh, so, the question is, uh, how, do you, um, how do you achieve such a program, for example, in free probability? And here I should say something. I should say also that um, this, this is really connected to uh, weak products because <laughs> it's easy to show that in terms of exponential generating series, for example, if you look at the exponential exponential generating series, and you take its uh, of momenta, um, well, not of momenta at the moment. You you just take the exponential uh, exponential generating series associated to the random variable x, and uh, you compute its um, uh, or the, the corresponding weak product. What you get is the exponential of tx divided by the expectation of uh, maybe I should do this that way. Right? I start from a random variable x, I introduce a uh, formal variable small x, and then I say that the, um, <coughs> this expression holds. So the the weak term associated to the exponential is the classical exponential divided by the um, 
exponential generating series, which is also the exponential of the uh, new line series that I have written. So that's a so strong connection between uh, cumulants and big polynomials in general. So uh, what about free probability? Here, the, the, this problem of uh, devising cumulants to, to handle uh, independence in free probability was solved by Speicher. And he introduced uh, free cumulants in the following way. So um, assume that you have uh, non-commutative probability space. Then uh, you can define free cumulants implicitly using the following formula. You take the sum so now uh, we are used to it. We have to take um, to index this kind of uh, formulas by non-crossing partitions. So we take the sum over all non-crossing partitions of n. Of what I will write, a pi a, which is by definition the product of I1 or Ka pi 1 with the notation I introduced previously. Ka A pi K pi is equal to addition to union of pi 1, pi 2, and pi K. So uh, this defines inductively the cumulants, the free cumulants associated to um, the sequence A1, An. And uh, so the, the, key, the key result is that um, so free cumulants linearize independence as expected. In the sense that a family of um, Free random vi or non commutative ra random variables is fully independent if and only if it holds true that for all p's, a p of a1 plus a n is equal to the sum a p of a1 plus a p of a n. So now uh, the question is how to account for these ideas in terms of of algebras. In classical probability, uh, we have seen this already, so I won't explain uh, this again, but uh, in classical probability, the Hopf algebra to use is always the same. It's the, the algebra of polynomials over formal variables uh, equipped with the, the coproduct that uh, makes all the variables primitive. And if you do so, the, the formula you obtain for uh, the evaluation of the coproduct acting on a monomial is given by so-called unshuffles. Well, as usual, its size, the product of the, the x indexed by the elements of i, and so on. So. Um, 
now, if you move to uh, non-commutative probability, um, for obvious reasons, you have to adapt this picture. That cannot hold immediately. And the, the right solution is obtained by uh, splitting one of the components of the crop product into pieces. This is related to what I explained uh, this morning, the fact that when you evaluate the linear form phi on a product of uh, random variables, some of which are independent, the formulas you get are not, are not the same than in the classical case. And instead of having, for example, as, as this morning, phi of A square, phi of B square, where you compute phi of A, B, A, B, you have um, uh, polynomial expression like phi, phi a to the square, phi b, b square, that sort of things. So to take this into account, you have to define uh, another core product, <coughs> which is obtained in the following way. So if you have a monomial x1, xn, you will send it to the sum of uh, all such sets of n. So the starting point is the same as uh, in classical probability. But to account of this, uh, the phenomena I just discussed, you have to split the, um, the right-hand side of the co-product in the following way. Where, uh, so this belongs to the tensor algebra over A. This belongs to the double tensor algebra over A, where I write T plus for um, A, uh, the direct sum of the tensor powers of A starting from, uh, from the tensor power one. Uh, and I include the constant at this level. And so, <coughs> so this is um, each element here is a tensor and we use the bar notation of, uh, I think, Heidelberg and MacLean to, uh, to denote um, tensor product of tensor products. And here the GIS are the connected components of N minus S, by which I mean uh, if you have a sequence, so X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, X6, X7, and I choose, uh, for example, this or S, then this, this will be uh, the G1 component. So G1 S will be 1, 2. This will be G2 S. And this will be X8. This will be uh, G2 S. So connected components in a discrete or in discrete case uh, with obvious meaning. And so this defines a new uh, form of coproduct that goes uh, as it stands from T of A to T of T plus of A. But we can extend it multiplicatively to, to build a true of algebra structure. on, sorry, on T of T plus of A. And so this is, uh, by experience, uh, the, the, the right structure to handle this kind of problems, to account for, the, for this kind of uh, non-commutative phenomena. <coughs> In particular, if you want to have an exponential formula relating uh, momenta and uh, free cumulants, you can split the co-product into two pieces. So you will uh, take for this piece the one such that you um, you decide that the first element you in the in the, in the tensor product 
uh, on which you, you apply a delta. So you require one to belongs to S, and here you require one not to be in S. If you decompose the, the coproduct this way, you can dualize the operations. You get products on the dual of the double tensor algebra. And so there are several constructions. You can do starting from this, but if you, uh, if you, why? So this is the usual convolution product associated to the op algebra. This is something we write usually with this notation. And then uh, if you define so the exponential of an element in the dual of the double tensor algebra to be uh, so a sort of analog of the time ordered product that was discussed several times during this uh, this uh, school. So you ask this to be uh, the unit of the the convolution algebra of linear forms on the double tensor algebra plus alpha plus alpha alpha plus alpha 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 and so on. So this is the time ordered exponential in a certain sense. Time ordered because there are no symmetric coefficients, there are no factorials appearing. Then uh, you can show that um, if you define a linear form phi on the double tensor algebra by requiring that phi acting on the double tensor is the product of the action of phi separately on each element of the tensor product. So this is the multiplicative extension of uh, the linear form phi So uh, the definition, I say that phi of a tensor A1, AK, and the tensor algebra of order K over A is by definition phi applied to the product of the AIs in A. Then it holds true up to details that I omit, but uh, that you can find in the, in the last reference I gave this morning. It holds true that uh, i is equal to the exponential, this time ordered exponential of a certain element, uh, kappa, uh, which is a linear form on the double tensor algebra. But that identifies essentially if you restrict to uh, uh, so to tensors of order one in the double tensor algebra that identifies with um, which phi shows recumulant. So you see two things uh, from this example. One thing is that you, um, so the, the, the algebraic and the co-algebraic framework to, to study uh, classical probability and classical cumulants can be extended to non-commutative probability. If you want to enter really details, you have to do this kind of thing. So you have to enter a more sophisticated algebraic framework and more, more sophisticated algebraic structures where you have extra inputs like this notion of uh, decomposition of a core product into two half core products and things like this, this notion of time ordered exponential, which is also important in the picture. So you, are, you have all this, these refinements uh, showing up. But it fits uh, globally in the, in the general picture I've, I've tried to draw about, uh, uh, around Vic calculus. And I would like to conclude the, the lectures by showing precisely how Vic calculus can be um, adapted to this non-commutative context.
So uh, as I did previously, I, I will give you references. So here the, the literature, at least the literature we are aware of is relatively limited. There, there are uh, papers by Jan Shelevich called uh, Apple Polynomials and Their Relatives. So this is a series of three papers. And so Ancelevich um, was the first actually to consider this problem and he, uh, he addressed it uh, from the point of view of Apple polynomials, this point of view I mentioned at the beginning. And so he developed a theory, uh, what we would call now, uh, wh what we prefer to call the theory of Vic calculus. So he addressed it from this point of view of uh, polynomial sequence and relations with between polynomials that are satisfied by uh, this uh, so-called um, Appelt sequences. Uh, and so what I'm going to explain is not this point of view, which is more so, uh, which, which is going in a different direction, but leads in the end to the same conclusions. But I, I will speak about something, uh, a different approach that leads to uh, also other results and uh, other insights. Uh, something we developed with uh, Kourouch. Nicolas Tapia, and Lorenzo Zambotti, and our paper is called Big Polynomials. In non-commutative probability, a group theoretical approach. And it's online, uh, so you can find it on archive, but it's going to appear. Uh, it's going to be published soon. So, um, maybe I should explain the title. There's a general idea when you have op algebras. Uh, op algebras are very cl closely connected to groups. Uh, op algebras are actually the good language to speak about uh, algebras of functions on groups. So anytime you have a op algebra, there's a group associated to it. There, there's a Lie algebra, and you can move from the group to the Lie algebra. And this is particularly, si particularly simple if the op algebra is commutative or co commutative. But even if it is uh, not, you can still make sense of group theoretical constructions. And so there's a sort of group theoretical background be behind what I'm saying. That is illustrated by the fact that all the time we have exponentials showing up. And so uh, it is true in, in classical group theory that you can use the ex exponential and the logarithm to go from the group to the Lie algebra. But this also holds even for this kind of uh, operations like uh, time order and exponential. So there's a sort of um, algebraic background behind all these constructions. So uh, how to define non-commutative weak products? So we, st we start again for, from a non-commutative probability space. And we have this sub-algebra structure I've just defined. We have uh, the map phi I've just defined. And uh, it's true actually that uh, phi can be inverted as a convolution inverse for formal reasons. <coughs> so you, this can be deduced from the fact that it's an algebra map, for example. Uh, a character, so character on uh, algebra maps to the ground field and of algebra always form a group, so the, the elements always have an inverse. Uh, but so it's true that uh, for this kind of abstract nonsense reasons that uh, phi has a convolution inverse. 
And uh, so we call that, in the classical case, the weak product map was defined by W of x to the n is equal to the convolution of the identity with the convolution inverse of the, the moment map. I'm switching the order, but it doesn't change anything because uh, everything is commutative and co-commutative in the classical case. So we can mimic this definition in um, a non-commutative setting, and we get the notion of non-commutative weak map or free weak map. which is something that lives on the double tensor algebra over the non-commutative probability space. And it's defined simply by using the same definition. So the identity uh, convolution with the inverse of what is now, uh, what takes the role of this uh, moment map, capital Psi. So uh, now the question is, okay, the, there's this formal definition of, uh, of non-commutative weak map, but can we use it to, or at least can we use it? Maybe it's a, it's a, it's a program, but um, does it have the expected properties of the weak map, the one we, we considered, especially in, the, um, in classical probability or quantum field theory? The answer is yes, uh, and this is essentially what I'm going to explain. So uh, first, an observation. So oh, how is this map acting concretely on uh, tensors? So first of all, Because of the structure of the coproduct, if you look at the form of the coproduct here, it's linear on the left hand side in the sense that it's going to send a tensor in T of A to a tensor in T of A times a tensor product of tensors, but uh, it's linear uh, in the tensor algebra on the left hand side, which means that W restricts to the tensor algebra, the classical tensor algebra over A. And so if you compute W evaluated on the product of elements of A, we will get an element, uh, a linear combinations of, uh, a linear combination of uh, tensors over A. So this is what, uh, it's natural to call the, the weak polynomial. Associated to a product, uh, a formal product of uh, non-commutative random variables. So it's a relatively important observation because you want, uh, or at least you prefer, the weak map to live inside the tensor algebra instead uh, of the double tensor algebra, which is a sort of uh, object introduced for technical reasons. But uh, the, the basic point of view is the one of tensors. Now, uh, the second observation is that You can also describe the, the non-commutative uh, weak morphism uh, very concretely in the sense that you can invert the formula and you will get that uh, the identity map is the convolution of W with Psi with the, the moment map. And if you expand this identity, what you will get is that if you have an element in the tensor algebra over A, It can be written as the sum of all such sets of n 
of W of AS times for the moment map evaluated on the, the connected components of the complement in the sense uh, I define, uh, well, I gave to this notion previously. So this gives you a, a recursive formula to compute the, the VIC uh, product map in terms of the, in terms of the momentum. And this is actually very similar to the classical uh, formula defining uh, big product in terms of uh, monomials uh, in the case of random variables, except that here we have this uh, expression which is polynomial in the phase, which is not the case in the usual probability. So that's one thing. Then, um, okay, to make things concrete, some examples, if you compute W acting on a random variable, a non-commutative random variable, you get the standard uh, expression, so you subtract simply the mean, if you evaluate it on a product, you get A1, A2, minus A2, A1, minus phi e2 minus phi a1 product in a with a2 minus 2 phi a1 phi a2 and so on so you have concrete formulas to describe the w's on this formula <coughs> and um, then what are the properties of this map So the classical VIC map uh, has several characterizations. I, I didn't uh, give all of them, but there are, there are characterizations, for example, in, in terms of um, uh, derivatives. So it holds true that uh, if you uh, look at the, the VIC polynomials associated to a given run on variable in the classical case, it's also true that uh, this formula, for example, is, um, is holds true. And together with the fact that the exponential, the, the expectation of um, so the n power of a random variable, and uh, well, the weak polynomial uh, evaluated on a random variable. Uh, of which you take the expectation is always zero for n uh, bigger than zero. These two, um, these two conditions characterize completely uh, big polynomials in the classical case, just because this gives you um, a recursive way of computing them. Uh, so this formula, for example, holds true also in the non-commutative setting, although it's, it's a bit more technical to make sense of it, but it holds true. So there's a similar result in the in the non-commutative setting. Then uh, th another property of W, which is a characteristic uh, of the non-commutative situation is that W is an algebra map. in the sense that if you compute W on a double tensor, it's going to be equal to W of the various elements of which you take the, the products in the double tensor algebra.
So why, uh, why is it true that this property is true? Uh, simply because W is defined as the convolution product of the identity with uh, the convolution inverse of phi. And as I mentioned, phi is a character. So an algebra map. from um, double tensor algebra to the, the ground field, okay, the complex numbers. And uh, <coughs> so I, I say this, but again, why did characters from a group? So the convolution of two uh, characters is a character. This is because um, if you look at this, uh, at the definition of the convolution product, by definition of, the, of algebra, the coproduct is an algebra map. If you have two algebra maps, F and G, then you will get a new algebra map from the tensor product of H with itself. Oh. Okay, in that case, say algebra map. If you have algebra endomorphisms of uh, H, then the convolution of two algebra endomorphisms is going to be an algebra endomorphism. And if you have two algebra maps to the complex numbers, you would have uh, an algebra map to the complex numbers. So uh, characters are closed under convolution, and they are invertible because uh, since they are algebra maps, they satisfy the the unit condition, which is enough in the kind of algebra I'm considering because they, are, they have a gradation and the, the dupe zero component is a ground field, uh, they're always invertible for that reason. So uh, there's a group structure. In particular, this implies that the convolution inverse of phi is also a character. And as the identity uh, is an algebra map, and the convolution, so for the reason I explained, of two algebra maps, is an algebra map, then we get the property I've stated. One nice thing of the, um, the calculus with of algebra is one uh, is that one, so you, you have settled the, the setting, then everything essentially comes for free. The theoretical properties come for free, but also the combinatorial formulas. They are obtained almost immediately from the, from the definitions and the, the structure definitions of the co-product and the product. It also holds true that uh, uh, so Vic uh, polynomials, a free Vic polynomials, the ones I've introduced are centered. So typically this follows immediately from the definition. If you compute phi, the identity convolution with phi convolution minus one, so this maps to the scalar, so phi is not going to act on this part. You get phi convolution with its convolution inverse. You get the unit map of the convolution product, which is zero on all non-zero uh, degree components. This is one essential property of uh, big products and one of the reasons why they are constructed in the, in the classical case. Now, uh, and essentially I will conclude with this, what is the link with free cumulants?
So we want to fill the gap, the, the last missing gap between the theory of non-commutative weak polynomials and, uh, for example, the free uh, central limit theorem, which is the, in the classical case, the fact that you can express weak polynomials uh, in terms of exponential, gen exponential generating series, one associated with uh, the weak product, the other one, the, the generic uh, exponential, exponential, exponential generating series associated to a variable, together with the, ex the exponential of the generating series of uh, cumulants. So is there something uh, holding true also in the, in the free case? The answer is yes. And it's simple, recall that we have that psi, so the moment map is the time ordered exponential of uh, kappa, the, the cumulant map. One can show by, uh, so formal, Um, a formal group theoretical calculus in this framework. That you can compute by the same uh, means the, co the convolution inverse of phi, and what you get is the time ordered exponential in a certain sense associated to the, the other um, component. Uh, sorry? Uh, sorry, minus kappa, yes. <laughs> You're right. Um, so the, the other um, half shuffle exponential associated to the picture, which is defined, so recall that this was uh, eta plus epsilon plus epsilon half shuffle and so on. So here you invert the, the order of everything and what you get is eta plus um, epsilon plus the other half shuffle, right half shuffle of epsilon with itself plus epsilon, 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 and so on. This is more or less in, in, in standard calculus, this is the way to relate the solution, uh, the forward solution of the differential equation to uh, what you obtain if you, uh, if you move backwards in time. So, I don't subscripts. No, no, this is correct. So the the um, the moment map classically the moment map is is expressed as an exponential in terms of the cumulants. Here we have the same expression, but where the exponential is re is replaced by the an exponential uh, time ordered exponential. Where by time ordered exponential I mean this kind of expression. You see, this is this is a sort of non, non mm, this is a non-associative exponential formula, and uh, the factorials are missing. But this is due to the fact that you decompose the product into two pieces. So, since you, since you decompose the product into two pieces, the the factorial disappear. This is the same. I mean, this is like integration of a cube of a, a symmetric function of the argument and uh, the integration of a semplex. This is really the same formalism that is, uh, that is behind these formulas. Okay, so um, we get therefore finally an expression for W in terms of exponentials. So which is the, the right analog of the, the free uh, framework. Of 
the formula I wrote previously. So given x random variable, or equivalently, more uh, abstractly, the definition of the classical VIC map as the convolution of the identity with the convolution exponential of uh, minus the, the cumulant map. So that's it. Uh, from this uh, consideration, you can arrive to uh, loss formula. For example, you can express the, the VIC map in the following way, as a sum of a subsets of N, as usual, of AS. But um, you can have um, an expression for the term, um, for the coefficient of AS in this uh, expansion, and what you get is a sum of a, so, By end, I mean interval partitions. So these are the partitions if you have a, an ordered sequence that splits the ordered sequence into uh, pieces of uh, consecutive elements. Uh, satisfying an extra condition, so you also have to have uh, that uh, disjunct union of pi with s is a non-crossing partition of n. And you have some coefficient minus one to the number of blocks, the power number of blocks times the product over the blocks of pi of kappa a pi i. So the appearance of, for those of you who, who know the, these notions, the appearance of interval partitions is not very surprising because um, the, so the, say, left half shuffle exponential is associated to the notion of free cumulants, but as a sort of dual notion, which is the notion of Boolean cumulants, which is associated to the, the other half, uh, half shuffle exponential. And, um, and the combinatorics of this uh, Boolean uh, cumulants of this Boolean uh, non-commutative calculus is governed by interval partitions in the same way that the, the combinatorics of uh, free probability is governed by non-crossing partitions. So this is the abstract reason why uh, you have this formula that mixes, in a certain sense, uh, free probability with what people call uh, Boolean probability. This is because of this mixing of, um, of uh, the, two, um, the two kind of exponentials you, you can construct in this uh, framework. And I will conclude with the notion of weak products. So uh, here again, uh, one can see the, the power of the algebraic formalism in the sense that uh, things are, are really governed by um, abstract group theoretical arguments, elementary, but that, uh, that lead to new ideas and new, new results. We have seen that W acts on T of A not just on uh, double tensors, but also on ord ordinary tensors. And actually it acts uh, by linear, uh, as a linear automorphism. as in the classical case, actually. So we can use W, as we did in the classical case, to, um, to create uh, new structures on T of A. In particular, we, we can transport 
and the reaction of W, the algebra structure of the tensor algebra, or the free associative algebra. of A. And so if we do so, we get a new product in T of A. So defined uh, by conjugacy, the, com uh, the composition inverse of W that we apply to X, the product with the convolution inverse of Y. So sorry, the convolution inverse of W that we apply to Y, you apply W, this defines a new product, which is by uh, construction um, associative, unital. So a product which is a candidate to be uh, the free weak product on T of A. And you can, you can even write down the formula for this product using the arguments I've given. So formal arguments, if you uh, compute the product of two tensors, you can expand it as a sum of all subset of n plus m of w of a s times psi or phi applied to uh, a k1 by a k m where uh, the blocks K1, Km are the connected components, but not of N plus M minus S, but um, of the corresponding restriction to, um, to N and uh, so to the, the indices uh, corresponding to the, the, f the first part of the product and the second part of the product. So the connected components of N minus N intersected with S and the translation of M by N uh, minus its intersection with, uh, with S. So I, I managed to be in time this uh, this time. Uh, so I will conclude uh, with this. What you see is that uh, there is this general framework that is consistent that also applies to new kind of situations. So there's this new theory of um, of non-commutative uh, weak polynomials that. So that uh, can be developed uh, from a purely of algebraic point of view. It can be done, as I mentioned, by, uh, by other uh, means, but uh, so Ancelevich did, did this by using, um, or, or part of what I explained was obtained by Ancelevich, but from a totally different point of view, starting from uh, the consideration of uh, non-commutative polynomials and some identities between uh, non-commutative uh, polynomials corresponding to what is called uh, Apple sequences. And um, there's this new picture emerging, but uh, it's under construction, so it's not uh, completely clear uh, at the moment what we can use it for, but it should be useful because clearly it fits perfectly into this uh, general idea that uh, classical probabilities can be lifted in a systematic way to the non-commutative framework, leading to new tools, uh, hopefully also in quantum field theory, maybe in planar quantum field theory, for example. So I will stop here.
the last thing you said, possible in the SP plan, what would you do? Would you elaborate a bit more? There's a strong connection between uh, planar uh, calculus in quantum field theory and uh, this kind of computations uh, in free probability. Uh, we, we have another paper that I didn't quote with Kourouche on this connection. It goes back to, um, yes, Kritanovich in the 70s maybe? Yes, in the 70s. There was this idea that when uh, Okay, well, when you're doing uh, classical quantum field th uh, theory, you have expansion in terms of uh, uh, Feynman diagrams, but um, you can rest, well, well, you know this, so I don't have to explain to you what uh, planar quantum field theories are. But the, the conclusion is that if you look at planar um, quantum field expansions, they are parameterized essentially by non-crossing partitions. And uh, so non-crossing partitions enter the game and they enter the game exactly in the same way than in free probability. I think this connection, uh, yes, is, uh, is, could have been one of the motivations of Speicher, I'm not sure, but it, it could have been one of the various motivations that led to the construction of uh, the theory of free probability. There was uh, some inputs coming from, uh, or many inputs coming, coming from uh, Voiculescu, uh, random matrices, system algebras, but there's, there's also a part of the story which is less uh, identified that comes from uh, so planar quantum field theory. And probably the reason is the same. Uh, planar theory, uh, planar quantum field theories corresponds to large end limits. So it's more or less the same phenomenon as for random matrices. So uh, at the very end, uh, the, there's also this, this link between uh, probability theory, in that case, uh, random matrices and uh, parts of uh, quantum field theories. Uh, 